last speaker of the session. So uh, we have Susan Rosenberg next. Um, she's going to be talking about uh, everything. <laughs> so the title of her talk is Biology Before and After the SOS Response, Genomes, Cells, Cancer, and Antimicrobial Resistance. So Susan, please go ahead and uh, share your screen. So I will not get to uh, acknowledge all the people from my lab and all of the wonderful collaborators who have uh, helped us with the few the, the things you'll hear about, a lot of work, a few projects, but some of these people you'll hear about specifically. So first, I am so glad to be here for your birthday, Evelyn. Um, and sorry that I have to miss mo most of it. It's been really a long time since you and I have caught up. So I thought I'd just give you a thumbnail of the last 30 years. Um, I started out in DNA repair, working on homologous recombination for my PhD in Frank Stahl's lab. I was not really interested in mutagenesis until I had my own lab. And then it was because of its uh, connection to evolution. Can, can you see my pointer, folks? Okay. And also because we discovered that double strand break repair by homologous recombination is mutagenic. Um, from the early 2000s to really into recent times, we've been discovering molecular mechanisms of mutagenesis that stress responses, many stress responses activate. Um, which is, I think, very important for evolution because it means that when cells or organisms are poorly adapted to their environment, they're going to increase mutagenesis and potentially increase their ability to evolve. So uh, the first stress response that we found was part of mutagenesis in starvation stressed E. coli was the SOS response, um, Evelyn Witkin's baby. And um, a quick thank you for communicating our paper on this topic and for helping so much with it. Also, I wanna help thank you for giving me the title for this review of a long time ago. I think it was just exactly right on. So from then, the early 2000s to now, we have been interested in this um, because of evolution of not just creatures, but the negative consequences like cancer and antibiotic resistance. And from then to now, interested in the possibility that if you understood these molecular mechanisms well enough and understood who the key hubs were that was making this whole business happen, then you might be able to think about inhibiting therapeutically as a preventative for, say, antibiotic resistance and potentially therapies uh, against developing resistance and against cancer. And um, I'm not going to talk much about it, but we actually have our first two anti-evolvability drugs, one we published a couple of years ago and one I hope we'll publish soon that slow development of antibiotic resistance in antibiotic-treated bacteria. So that's after the SOS response. I'm gonna actually spend a lot of time talking also about before the SOS response. And of course, before the SOS response is DNA damage, which activates it. Often um, folks draw it with pictures like this, me included, which could give you the impression that most of DNA damage is coming from exogenous sources from the outside world. But it seems, really like a tremendous amount of DNA damage that drives processes of mutagenesis and these kind of problems are really uh, the result of processes in our bodies uh, and in cells. So there's an entire, I'll show you, very large, what we'll call a DNA damageome, a collection of proteins that organisms possess that if their expression is tweaked just slightly, if they're slightly dysregulated, one of the results is DNA damage and a chain of events like this. So I'll tell you about that as well. So stress-induced mutagenesis. Um, we found that for mutations that are happening in starvation stressed E. coli cells in an assay I'm just not gonna describe today, 
that three stress responses were required for the mutations to happen. And by required, what I mean is if we knock out a key activator of the stress response, uh, let's say this was the assay, the number of mutants goes down a lot, and then we do a pile of controls to make sure that it's really mutagenesis, not any number of other things that could cause the assay to show a negative. And then, um, so this way we discovered that the general stress response of E. coli, the sigma S response, um, also a starvation response, is required for mutagenesis and starving E. coli. So is the SOS response. So is one of the uh, unfolded protein responses and membrane proteins stress response. And I think because of this, because you have to have stress responses activated for the mutagenesis happen, to happen, it's fair to call it stress-induced mutagenesis. Well, before the stress responses, when my brand new lab started working on this, we discovered that the mutagenesis in the stressed E. coli was happening by a mutagenic repair of DNA double-strand breaks. Um, our first papers were finding that the proteins for double strand break repair by homologous recombination are required for the mutagenesis to happen. Um, though the uh, mutations themselves look like DNA polymerase errors and uh, responsible for really most of it is an SOS induced DNA polymerase that perhaps Graham said a word about, I don't know, DNA polymerase four. Okay, and now I'm going to give you just the briefest thumbnail of how a couple of these molecular mechanisms work um, without telling you the evidence because this is a lot of old work. So for two stress-induced mutagenesis mechanisms that are happening in E. coli under stress, um, both of them are kinds of double strand break repair that cause mutations. So in the first one, I'll tell you that this is a pathway, a mechanism that makes small mutations like base substitutions and indels. So in this one, things start with a double strand break, which not always, but frequently will induce the SOS response, which is required. The SOS response upregulates these three DNA polymerases, uh, two of which are very low fidelity. And the major contributor to these mutations in many different assay systems is PAL4. Um, but even though SOS has upregulated PAL4 tenfold, repair of double strand breaks, which requires some DNA synthesis, is not mutagenic, we showed, um, until another stress response is activated, the starvation stress response or general stress response. Now this is turning on in response to an awful lot of stressors, many of which have not a thing to do with DNA damage. So it's like the cell is saying, I have to feel this problem, uh, starvation, acid shock, osmotic shock, reactive oxygen, antibiotics, and this problem, DNA damage, and then mutations can happen. So when sigma S response turns on, then these DNA polymerases are the, the errors that they make show up in the, in the synthesis associated with double strand break repair right next to where the break happened, uh, looking like they are participating in or being allowed to leave their errors in, in uh, break repair, making it a mutagenic process, when otherwise, without this, it's really a pretty high fidelity repair mechanism. S at the same time, mismatch repair is transiently downregulated. So it's like error-prone polymerases, lack of mismatch repair, it's a big up. So the other pathway I'll tell you about has been a lot of work from Phil Hastings' lab. Um, and in this mechanism, again, it starts with a break. But uh, it does not use the SOS response. It does use the general stress response. And in this mechanism, breaks repair off of starting with a piece of DNA uh, as a, a partner that they don't have sequence identity to. And that generates genome rearrangements, including amplifications, inversions, uh, uh, those kind of things. And both of these things, uh, there are things like them happening in um, human cancers and in human cells. Okay, so although I 
gave you none of the evidence for this. Um, I've been telling you that double strand break repair in E. coli is a pretty high fidelity process unless stress responses get induced, unless the cell feels that something is wrong out there and in there. And when the sigma S response is induced, you get a switch from high fidelity to mutagenic break repair. Um, and importantly, this switch, which makes break repair go from good to mutagenic, um, it doesn't help repair. So in two different assays, um, with really careful measurements, the efficiency of double strand break repair is either as good or better when we get rid of PAL4 or the general stress response. So these are not about being able to repair the hole in the DNA. They're about something else, which maybe could be creation of the diversity that drives evolution. So this idea that you could have inducible evolution um, like a lot of ideas, you know, other folks thought of it. And um, I don't know how much it was in your mind, Evelyn, but the, it was really articulated very directly by Hatch Eccles in a 1981 cell paper where he talked about the SOS response, um, cancer, and evolution. And he, he suggested exactly this kind of idea that, that stress responses, and he focused on SOS, could increase evolvability. Well, since that paper, really until modern day, people have argued against him. They don't even know who to cite anymore, but they do. And how they do it is they say, well, of course you need the SOS response to repair your DNA. You've got to upregulate those repair proteins. So you, you must have SOS and maybe you just can't evolve high fidelity DNA repair. And so it's not like cells are turning up evolution. Uh, it's like they're just trying to fix the DNA and this is the price they have to pay. Um, I think if Hatch had worked on the Sigma S response instead of thinking about the SOS response, he would have been able to answer them because this switch from high fidelity to mutagenic repair is absolutely not needed for those cells to survive the break. Um, so, okay, so I've talked to you about E. coli. It has been so much fun and so exciting over the past many years uh, to see many labs find processes that are have similarities to what I showed you in E. coli, processes in which different stress responses in human cells uh, and in human cancers activate a different kind of switch from high fidelity to mutagenic repair of double strand breaks. And how most of these work is that when these stress responses turn on, this one, by the way, I think is like the sigma S response. When they turn on, the cells transcriptionally downregulate RAD51 and BRCA1, so they become bad at doing double strand break repair by homologous recombination. Um, when they do, they also uh, repair their breaks using non-homologous and micro-homologous pathways that cause genome rearrangements. So it's a different kind of switch, but to from high fidelity to mutagenic repair, also controlled by stress responses. And they also transcriptionally downregulate mismatch repair proteins, MLH1 and MSH2 under these various stress responses, which is going to promote both genome rearrangements and small mutations. So that's been wonderful. And I think maybe a take home of this is that the stress responses might be important biomarkers in people for when they are about to get in trouble with mutagenesis and might be interesting drug targets. One of the reasons um, I think the stress response regulators are interesting potential targets for drugs that could slow evolution of cancer or antibiotic resistance is because when we um, did a screen several years ago to try to find as many proteins as possible in E. coli that were part of this process of stress-induced mutagenesis, we turned up a list of uh, 110 or so, and, there, and I know we missed them. There, there's definitely more than that. But of the ones that we found, more than half of them by a series of lots of genetic and single cell kind of assays 
functioned in making mutagenesis happen by being upstream of activation of three, these key stress responses, sigma S, SOS, and the membrane stress response. Um, and if we just look at this network the way people do uh, with these association maps, at the hub of networks like this are the stress response regulators, the transcriptional activators. So this, I think things like this, where if you could inhibit that, you might make the whole network fall apart. That's why I think they might be interesting uh, drug targets. And in recent work that I, I wish I could tell you about, but I won't today, um, this whole business of stress-inducible mutagenic repair of double-strand breaks um, happens in cells that are exposed to low doses of the antibiotic ciprofloxacin. And using flow cytometry, a lot of genetics, several other things, John Pribis was able to show that the cipro induces reactive oxygen in a small subpopulation of the cells that the reactive oxygen he showed induces the sigma S response also in about 20% of cells. And if we purify these cells, these are the cells that generate the mutants by mutagenic break repair. Among the mutations are mutations that confer resistance to other antibiotics um, besides this fluoroquinolone. Okay, and he identified an FDA approved drug that inhibits this process and lets ciprofloxacin work, but prevents or slows greatly the evolution of resistance to other antibiotics. Okay, so in the, the last part of what I'll tell you about today, um, thinking about what's upstream of the SOS response and DNA damage, this was kind of planted in my head uh, by looking at Bob Weinberg's ideas about what are the important cell biological events that are part of cancer. And in this uh, more recent iteration of it, if you look at this picture, these symbols represent a lot of things that cells do. Um, uh, crank up their metabolism, uh, inflammation promotes, hypoxia, et cetera, a lot of things that you would think are the cell biology of cancer. And there's one little thing that's the genetics of cancer, genome instability. And you could look at this picture and get the impression that DNA, like if you think of all the genes and proteins that if perturbed could be cancer promoting, you could get the impression that it's kind of 90% cell biology and maybe 10% evolvability. A lot uh, we you would have thought most of which was DNA repair because as you know you know it's very important loss of DNA repair uh, definitely causes cancer driving mutations. So what I'll tell you about is when we tried to go upstream of this uh, DNA repair and genome instability, um, we get a lot of processes that are affecting levels of DNA damage and. They are proteins that when you look at them, you would have put them in these other boxes. You wouldn't have thought they had much to do with DNA. So this is really about the SOS response. Uh, years ago, a student in my lab uh, made the first cells that when they have an SOS response, they fluoresce because they've got this transgene in their chromosome, which is the Sully promoter linked to M. cherry. And with that, Jun Shah, who was a student at the time, did an overexpression screen of all greater than 4,000 genes in E. coli to find any that when you have just a little bit too much, like maybe two, three, four, five times too much, cause an SOS response in some way, provoke DNA damage. The reason overexpression I thought was probably uh, useful is because if you look at populations of clonal cells that are supposed to really be identical, they are so not. They vary tremendously in gene expression levels. So in this uh, old work of Michael Elowitz, what you're seeing is bacteria that have two different housekeeping promoters hooked up to do two different fluorescent protein genes. And you look at this and you realize that tens of percents of cells at any moment are gonna be overexpressing something. 
So it seemed like a pretty normal thing. And this, this kind of picture is true in populations, clonal populations of human cells too. So he did this overexpression screen. He um, identified a, a list that were quantitatively very much induced for DNA damage. This is flow cytometry. And the red one is one of our overexpression candidates. And after doing a lot of assays to really demonstrate for all of these proteins that they're promoting DNA damage and not doing some other thing that makes fluorescence, this was the E. coli list that June came up with. It's 208 proteins. A lot of them do things that you would not have thought were DNA, membrane proteins, protein synthesis, cell division, metabolism, transcription, unknown function. These are the kind of things that if you saw mutations in these processes in somebody's cancer, you would think, oh, regulation of gene expression and um, loss of growth control or et cetera. You would not be thinking DNA and mutations. We know we missed half because of some limitation of the screen. So it really should be over 400, uh, which is about 10% of all of the genes in E. coli. That's a lot of genes and a lot of biology. So we used this because we really did wanna know uh, a little bit about human proteins and cancer. And in the first part of this, we just looked at human homologs of these 208 E. coli proteins uh, that because they all do different things, but they have this one phenotype of a little bit too much causes DNA damage. We're calling this big collection, the DNA damage all. So we looked at human cells for proteins that are homologs, just proteins that have um, sequence identity. It's no, uh, no cherry picking, no favorites. It's purely quantitative. Oh, I'll show you that. But first, it is true, as I, I think probably no one would be surprised, that higher DNA damage levels correspond with greater mutations. And when we sequence the mutations, they're all different kinds of things, depending on what was overexpressed. They are not just a pile of what you would look at and say, here's SOS mutagenesis. There's everything. Okay, so in human, there are 284 homologs, proteins with amino acid sequence identity to the 208 DNA damage on proteins. Um, and these are overrepresented as altered in uh, cancer genomes, um, uh, uh, sorry, it, among known and predicted drivers. Really interestingly, if you look in the RNA and sequence, DNA sequence data from human cancers in TCGA, in the Cancer Genome Atlas, and ask whether the RNAs of these 284 proteins have a relationship to the, the mutation burden in the tumor. Um, so blue is positive correlation, red is negative correlation. Here's all genes, all human genes, not a lot going on. Here's the 284 homologs. Yes, uh, they, are, they are quite overrepresented in, um, as overexpressed RNAs in cancers that have high mutation loads in all of these different kinds of cancer that are on the bottom. So that's provocative. Uh, and for, the, for a few of them, there's not a lot of uh, outcome data in this database, but there's some, and uh, for a few different kinds of cancers, high levels of these RNAs are correlated with um, worse survival. Okay, so my friend Kyle Miller and collaborator and his lab um, helped us to look at these human proteins in human cells. They made N-terminal GFP fusions to a, a, a collection of 70 or so of those human homologs. Let's call them candidate human DNA damage on proteins. Transfected them into two different kinds of human cells. Did a couple of assays that indicate markers of human DNA damage response. And because transfection is not very efficient, we only look here at the green cells that are GFP positive. This is flow cytometry. Um, because those ones have been transfected. They have this fusion gene. And among those, the question is, do they have unusually high levels of this DNA damage marker? There are three different assays. Uh, they did each one twice. We counted anything that scored as positive twice as a positive. And the result is that just under half of the 70 proteins that we looked at when slightly overexpressed in human cells 
they do promote DNA damage as seen by uh, visibility of these DNA damage markers. So that's not bad for E. coli. So you might be thinking, is this just, this is how it is with proteins in human? It's not really. Um, so another lab did a much more targeted screen where they overproduced a bunch of proteins that actually reside in the nucleus, many of them touching DNA. And when they did that screen, their validation rate was about 2%. So E. coli, putting our, you know, our look at human through E. coli was actually, it seems helpful. Uh, and the human proteins went overproduced. Their levels of DNA damage marker correspond to um, mutagenesis in a loss of function human cell mutation rate assay. So I will not be able to tell you all about the molecular mechanisms. I'll just give you a thumbnail of a few ways that June used to try to take apart what are these 208 E. coli proteins doing that makes DNA damage. So for all 208, he asked, do you have too many double strand breaks in your cell? And he did that using an engineered protein that we developed that uh, makes double strand breaks visible as fluorescent proteins. Um, so that's one test. Only 41% of them did. So a lot have DNA damage that doesn't seem like it's double strand breaks. We know the efficiency of this. Uh, it's quite efficient. He also, so double strand breaks are not the whole deal with endogenous DNA damage. He also looked for replication forks that are stalled. And when replication forks stall and they can uh, make a four-way DNA junction structure, we could see them using another protein we engineered that's uh, very four-way junction specific uh, and is a GFP fusion. So we can see those as foci and we use E. coli genetics to get rid of another source of four-way junctions so that we knew that these foci were really reverse forks, not recombination intermediates. 51% um, of the cells have too many reverse forks. And we could look at other things like loss of the DNA in a living cell, which could be a chromosome segregation failure, also a single cell assay by flow cytometry. So I'm not even gonna tell you all the assays he did that could indicate what kinds of DNA damage might be happening and by what processes. He did a total of seven. And these are the three I just mentioned to you. When he grouped them in using a cluster analysis, they had little enriched zones. And I wanna, so all of these data, what they are, are for all of those assays he did, the readouts are quantitative. So he could take the score and uh, set them equal to Z scores. And that's what these colors are that you're seeing red is more, blue is less of whatever. Um, and all of these are online, they're published, they're online. Anyone can look at them using the E. coli gene name, uh, the name of a human gene homolog, et cetera in this database. So if we look at just at the, the single cell assays, which I think were a little bit higher resolution, you can see that there's patches of kinds of proteins that uh, seem to do a lot of one thing. So in this group of a lot of reversed forks are DNA binding transcription factors. In this group of probable chromosome segregation failure, that's where the replication and repair proteins were. And in this one of high reactive oxygen membrane spanning transporters. So given the time, I am not going to show you all of the mechanisms we learned. I'll just tell you a word about two that June found in E. coli that Kyle's lab then validated in human or found something similar. Um, one is that overproduction of many different kinds of transmembrane transporters leads to high levels of reactive oxygen, which cause DNA damage. We saw that with many transporters in E. coli, and uh, Kyle saw it with components of a potassium transporter in human. And there are proteins, uh, this methylase and also PAL4, that cause DNA damage dependently on their ability to bind the replosome clamp, but independently of their catalytic activity as if too much occupancy might be a problem. Okay, so we're gonna have no mechanisms because we're out of time. And I'll just return to this picture and say, um, having looked at the overexpression of this set of proteins,
it seems like a lot of them, which you might have assigned to processes in this group, may possibly be acting upstream here, uh, causing DNA damage that could potentially be driving the evolvability component. So a lot of different cancer protein functions seem like they're indirect effectors of DNA damage, among other jobs they do. Uh, there are a lot of mechanisms, uh, sadly, of which I've shown you none. And um, the platform of E. coli to human was really useful. So let me stop there and, oh, it's late, I'm sorry. Let me stop there and if there's time for a question, I'll take it.